physicsinfo.co.uk Another in the series of Physics GCSE tutorials. Combined Science Waves Topic 4 Waves transfer energy and information without transferring matter. The particles in water move up and down as a wave passes. In air, they move backwards and forwards, in both cases returning to the same place. To take a closer look at how they behave, waves are best studied in a tank of water. The water appears to be moving from right to left. Pushing a dipper into the tank at one end produces a series of simple waves. The waves move along, but place a float in the water and it stays where it is. But this time the motion is backwards and forwards. Focus on just the orange spot and you'll see that it moves up and down. It oscillates. Although the waves travel from right to left, the particles on the surface of the water are simply bobbing up and down. And this particle diagram shows how the particles are affected as the wave passes through. There are two distinctly different types of wave longitudinal and transverse. Longitudinal waves are where the displacement is parallel to the direction of travel. These waves need solids, liquids or gases to pass through. Transverse waves have a displacement perpendicular, that's at 90 degrees, to the direction of the wave. Both longitudinal and transverse waves have all the characteristics of any wave. We will look at frequency, wavelength, amplitude, period, wave velocity and wave fronts in the next few clips. The wavelength of a wave is the distance from one point on one wave to the same point on the next wave. This is usually measured from the peak to peak, but it can be from anywhere. Wavelength is a distance and it's measured in meters. Here are two waves. There are clearly some differences between them. And that difference is the distance from one peak to the next. The distance is called the wavelength and the wavelength for the top wave is twice that of the bottom wave. This is another way of showing it, with the wavelength being the distance between two peaks on a ripples in a pond, or even between two troughs. The symbol we use for wavelength is the Greek letter lambda, like an upside down Y. The frequency of a wave is a measure of the number of vibrations or the number of waves passing a point every second. Frequency is measured in hertz or seconds to the minus one. In this clip you can see that the frequency is the number of waves going through the finishing line every second. 
Now the frequency is increased, so more waves pass through the finishing line per second. This is a higher frequency. Frequency can be related to the colour of light or the pitch of sound, and the symbol we use is the letter F. Apart from frequency and wavelength, there are a number of terms applied to waves that you are expected to use. The first one is amplitude. Amplitude is a distance from the midpoint of the wave to the peak or to the trough. The larger the amplitude, the greater the amount of energy. So a sound wave would be louder, a light wave would be brighter. If frequency is the number of waves per second, then the period is one over the frequency, or the time taken for one wave to pass a particular point. A frequency of 10 hertz would give a period of one over 10, or a tenth of a second. The wave velocity, or the speed of the wave, is related to both the frequency and the wavelength. The boat is just bobbing up and down, but the wave is moving from left to right. The speed at which the wave is moving can be measured and is given the symbol V. As I said, wave speed uh, is related to the frequency and the wave length by a thing called the wave equation. The wave equation says that V equals F lambda. Velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. And finally, the wave front, an area on the wave where all the peaks or all the troughs line up. We can view this ripple on a pond from above and represent it with a series of concentric circles. Then we can superimpose on this the conventional wave diagram that we're used to. The rings now show the peaks of the wave. And these represent the wave fronts. Light waves and water waves are both transverse. Sound waves are longitudinal. There are a series of compression waves travelling through the air. Earthquakes are caused by both types of wave travelling through the ground. Earthquakes generate both longitudinal pressure or P waves and transverse shear or S waves. The longitudinal P waves will travel through the core of the Earth. They move slower in liquids and this causes them to change direction resulting in a shadow zone where they're not felt. The slower transverse S waves only travel through solids, therefore they don't travel through the molten outer core. S waves also leave a much larger shadow zone. Finally, it's possible to use the arrival time difference between the faster P waves and the slower S wave. If you know the interval, you can slip that vertically between the two lines of the graph and where it fits in, that will be the distance away of the event. We said that the P waves in the Earth change direction when they slowed down. This is called refraction and it's defined as a change in direction due to a change in speed. Shining a powerful light source through a thin slit produces a straight narrow beam. Place a glass block in its path and the beam starts to behave differently as the block is rotated. Some of the light is reflected, the rest passes into the glass. The light bends in one direction as it enters the block and in the other as it emerges from the lower edge. This shift in direction is called refraction. To work out what's happening, 
think of light as a series of waves. This ripple tank uses a dipper to send parallel water waves across its surface. Putting a plastic sheet into the water makes this part of the tank shallower than the rest. Waves travel more slowly in shallow water. This change in speed changes the wavelength. The wavelength on the top is shorter than the one on the bottom. When the sheet is at an angle, the waves also change direction. The wave fronts bend as they reach the plastic sheet. To understand how speed can cause a change of direction, imagine a truck approaching marshy ground. If the marsh is at an angle, the right wheel slows first, the left carries on at speed for longer, swinging the truck round. So when light hits a glass block, it changes direction because it changes speed. Place a glass trough in the beam and you can see how water also affects the path of light. The bending of light helps explain why this apparently straight stick is in fact bent. While this bent stick is actually straight. So, how might we measure the speed of a water wave, or the speed of sound? First of all, let's look at the speed of a wave in water. This very simple demonstration just uses a plant plot, a meter ruler, and a stopwatch. You just time how long it takes for the wave created to travel half a meter and then use the equation wave speed equals distance divided by time. It's the same equation whether you're measuring the speed of the wave or the speed of a runner. There is another way you can measure the speed of a water wave. If you look at, say, a sea wall and can count the number of waves passing a point every second and you know the distance between the waves, you can alternatively use the wave equation to work out how fast the wave is travelling. The wave equation is wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. V equals F lambda. Now, one idea of how to measure the speed of sound in air. Starting with a single loud noise, for example a firing pistol, or popping a balloon. And setting it up as far away as possible. In this instance, the balloon was 150 meters away from the observers. And the distance can be measured with a tape measure or perhaps a trundle wheel. The observers simply record the time difference between seeing and hearing. With a distance of 150 meters and an average time of 0.4 seconds. The overall speed was found to be 375 meters per second. Using a video recorder would be one way to reduce the human error in measuring time. It is possible to use the wave equation again to measure the speed of sound in a solid. If you hit a metal rod, it will ring with a very specific frequency. The wavelength of the sound produced is exactly twice the length of the rod. So knowing the frequency and the wavelength, it is possible to use the wave equation to calculate the wave speed.
The length of this aluminium rod is measured and then it is suspended from two elastic bands. The rod is struck on the end with a hammer and the frequency measured using an app on the phone. The rod is 50 centimetres long, so that's one metre in total, and the frequency around 6,000 hertz, which means the speed of sound in aluminium is about 6,000 metres per second. Waves have a number of properties that you should be able to at least discuss. We've seen light reflected and refracted in the glass block and P waves refracted in the earth. These are some other terms, absorb, transmit, refract, reflect. Bang, on the screen is a visual display of that sound. Different frequencies will reverberate for different amounts of time, so you will see that and hear that. And as it gets quieter, we will turn up the level on the microphone so it's easier for you to hear. Right, everyone ready? There is a core practical associated with this topic. The practical is to investigate the suitability of equipment to measure speed, frequency and wavelength of a wave in a solid and fluid. And that's it. Thank you for watching.